Here you go. Ten minutes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to call to order the Administrative Matters Meeting of the Larimer County Board of Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, September 10th, 2019. I am Tom Donnelly. I am the Chairman of the Board of Commissioners this year, joined by John Kafalis, Commissioner from District 1, Steve Johnson, Commissioner from District 2, Elizabeth Carter from the Larimer County Court and Recorder's Office is here to keep the minutes of our meeting. Our County Manager, Linda Hoffman, is with us. Uh, at the control panel, there's her name tag, her name badge, uh, and Alicia Jeffers from the Commissioner's Office is here to time the public comment portion of this meeting. It is the tradition of this Board of Commissioners to begin this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to ask you to stand and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks everyone for that. Uh, first item of business for the board this morning is public comment. Um, first up is uh, Dr. Corey Carroll. Dr. Carroll, welcome. Good morning. Yes, sir. Um, I have a letter that I actually emailed you all. This morning. Um, indeed. So here's the copies, although I hopefully won't have you uh, totally read them while I'm talking, but it's, it's your... <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, three weeks ago, and my, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Corey Carroll. I'm a family physician. I was here three weeks ago uh, concerned about uh, public health in the form of pollution, ozone. And at that meeting, um, Chairman Donnelly made a statement that we were seeing a decline in ozone in the state, which was news to me. So I did a little research and tried to kind of sort out the details and, and as I found is is typical with many things there's uh, more confusion and difficulty in <clears throat> difficult topics so the um, the letter that CDPHE created December 14 2018 did show a decline in the ozone um, I did contact mr. Silverstein who was the um, the regional air quality member that signed it to try to get some clarity on how the data was being presented because in discussing with other individuals um, there's uh, a debate whether that's actually the case. Um, I have yet to fully um, come to consensus on the discussion with Mr. Silverthing. We're still kind of trying to figure this out, but it's confusing. Um, I think what I wanted to point out is that as many things, especially in my job as a doctor, there's never anything that's completely clear and cognizant. The job I have is to find as much uh, of the truth in the statement, try to uh, put aside my biases, any economic drivers, and basically give my patients the truth so that they can make a decision. As county commissioners, your job is very uh, difficult. I don't even begin to understand the nuance, uh, but you're making decisions for the county and our citizens. Um, I think it's clear to many of us that the escalating oil and gas is a problem. There's more harm than benefit. I was joking today with one of my staff about, well, if this was um, THC shops trying to increase their uh, um, activity in our neighborhoods, I think there would be a little bit more concern uh, than we're seeing with oil and gas. So to me, this is a zoning issue. This is something we shouldn't basically um, allow to continue until we understand the uh, the damage that's occurring and, and the information I've summarized in my letter and I hope that you will take that into account and stop a new, uh, any new permitting of gas so that we can get a handle on this before it gets too late and we're behind the eight ball. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Good to see you again. Uh, H. Thomas Hone. Hope I said your name correctly. Today. Welcome. Thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Yes. Give us Thank your you. name, please, and your comments. My name is H. Thomas Hain. Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Tom Hain. I'm here to speak about my concerns regarding the possible regulatory capture of Colorado County Boards and commissioner Commissions, including this commission. 
During the rulemaking of SB 181, which has passed to prioritize public and environmental health above the promotion of oil and gas in Colorado. Government and regulatory agencies were originally created to act in the public interest instead of advancing the commercial and political concerns of industries they were charged with regulating. A contrary example of this is the Halliburton loophole spearheaded in secrecy by Vice President Dick Cheney and ex CEO of Halliburton, one of the world's largest providers of products and services of the fossil fuel industry. The loophole has allowed the fossil fuel industry to override key regulations preventing the degrading of air, water, and therefore public and environmental health, now to the point of killing our planet. I've lived and worked in Larimer County for 35 years, and I've seen the polluting the fossil fuel industry has done in Front Range and West Slope communities. Therefore, on behalf of my family, my neighbors, and younger generations, I ask you to issue a moratorium on oil and gas permits in our county until Colorado citizens are allowed to have a say in the way oil and gas development will occur in Colorado through the implementation of SB 181. I agree with the young Swedish climate change activist, Greta Thunberg, who said, I believe that the biggest danger is not our inaction. The real danger is when companies and politicians are making it look like real action is happening, when in fact, almost nothing is being done apart from clever accounting and creative PR. Please, don't let regulatory capture happen in Larimer County. Thanks, sir. Good to see you, Tom. Yeah. Uh, Deb Bjork. Hi. Hey, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you again. See you, too. I'm Deb Bjork, and um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I want to thank the Larimer County Commissioners and the county staff and the task force for the opportunity at this upcoming open house to hear the, what the task force has been accomplishing and how they're incorporating SB 181 into their recommendations, as well as the 16-point directive and the forms 2A and 2 into um, their consideration. In addition, we know that they're tasked with protecting our beautiful Larimer County and our land, air, water, as well as the health and safety of our people and animals. And as they weigh these considerations for oil and gas permitting, we trust that they're taking this into consideration in regards to our air quality, including air ozone and residual particles, particularly the percentage due to fracking and inversion, as well as water quality, including our reservoirs, the Poudre River and its tributaries, lakes and streams, and our land use, with special need for protection of our dairy farms, excuse me, our schools, homes, open space, and public lands. In addition, you are entrusted with protecting the health and safety of our Larimer County residents, which must be given top priority when considering any oil and gas permitting. The task force and the county has a weighty responsibility to consider the needs of the land, the people, and the animals for future generations, especially considering the plan to put approved regulations into a 20-year land use plan. SB 181 in the state of Colorado have made it clear that any local regulations are for additional protection and cannot go below the threshold of the new state law sets. This includes any well applications in the pipeline predating SB 181. So we are hopeful and frankly expect that you, the county commissioners, task force, and county workers are working in our best interest as the law requires. Thus, we're eager to, um, to attend the open house. However, we're concerned with the limited lead time in the announcement of the open house to Larimer County residents. The announcement was not listed on the county website until September 5th or maybe early September 6th. This is less than a week, only four business days before the open house. It's quite concerning that the bulk of Larimer County residents likely have no idea this event is taking place. Yet the outcome of the task force will affect residents, la land, air, and people for generations. We stand ready to aid in the, uh, the assistance of the task force, and as such, we're asking you to include this flyer for presentation or availability at the open house. This fact was created by the Colorado Department of Public Health, 
and it focuses on issue health issues caused by fracking. The residents of Larimer County have the right to know about potential exposure of chemical pollutants through air, water, common health effects, and when to seek medical care or who to talk to at the state about a health concern. We've previously given the commissioners copies of this and are offering it to you again today. We would deliver them to Matt and um, to Matt and Leslie for the open house. Please let me know by Thursday morning whether you're going to allow this, and my email is on this uh, Very good. copy of it. Thank you, Deb. This is public comment. Uh, that's all the folks who have signed up. If anyone, hold on. If there's anyone who would like to make, additionally, who would like to make public comment, we'd give you the opportunity to come forward at this time. Anyone? Yes. Oh, okay. And then, <coughs> and, then, and then we'll get you, okay? Nancy? Hopefully it'll be better. Hi. Give us your name and give us your comments. I'll fill out the sheet for you. Um, I uh, don't give my last name because I'm protected under the address confidentiality program. Very good. So my name's Chris. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you, John. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a situation that's come to my attention, and I wanted to uh, make sure that we have uh, some sort of resolution rather quickly. I've been trying to apply for child support uh, because uh, I, have a, I have a need for it. And following all the directions from the county, I've gone in. And of course, when you're ACP client, you have, they don't have very many people on to be able to hear me or listen to what I needed to have done. But then you add a situation that came about in error through food stamps. And what happened is that um, this letter that was produced produced an acronym of CRS something. And uh, the situation is this. My daughter was 18. I wound up with a food stamp um, redetermination that, that was uh, error. Because of that, that caused uh, intense negotiations with the food stamp people. Also, about this time, I wound up and, I, and before this board, in regards to an average of $638 that was put upon me, and I had requested the board please create a job because I'm on disability because I have no way to pay this back. And graciously, the reporter Harold did a story on it, and some kind person anonymously paid that $638 for me so I could, I could survive. Because of the incompetency with the food stamp people, and because of the way I was treated, because it's supposed to be a federal bill and they were being audited at the time, um, I had the reporter Harold lady come. They didn't say that I couldn't bring her um, to the meeting with me, but they were prohibited her from being there. Um, I got physically worse. When I saw you gentlemen the first time, um, Mr. Kapalas was on his board. And I started to get physically worse ill-wise. I wound up with whooping cough and pneumonia with asthma, and I'm diabetic. So consequently, uh, as the progression to trying to get this mess straightened out with food stamps continued, um, I wound up being unable to hear, quite frankly. The mm -hmm. infection uh, caused where I would be loud and not realize I was being loud. People, when they get older, lose their hearing. They have a tendency to talk louder. And so consequently, um, in trying to finish this up, I had asked for um, them to take Emily off which they did, but the thing is that they never sent me officially the corrected paperwork until about three weeks later. And at that time, we had a hearing supposed to be in that three-week period of time. Well, because of their error, it would, allowed, would have allowed for an extra uh, time. So they did allow me that, but the problem is this. I got very sick. I was on medications, and therefore when trying, I was trying to talk to them, they would not grant me um, a hearing to be extended. And according to the federal law, I should have had that hearing extended, but I was forced to settle. So in this letter that was sent, and Mr. Kafalis has this letter, okay. it paints a person that I am not. It was a cocktail letter. They p picked up everything negative that they could find, throw it in there so that they could disparage my character and slander me. Chris, we'll have John share the letter with us and, and we'll, we'll look into it. I okay, very good. There is no contact information. I took a picture at the Larimer County f of, um, welfare office yesterday. Uh, there's supposed to be a commission or a, CDF, a CDHR civil rights person that is connected with the state with a phone number, but it's bogus. It's void. The information for the clients is not current. You can't find who to get a hold of to file a complaint against the county regarding this. You can't find okay. one about your John, rights being violated. John will make sure that you get that information. Thank you very much. I promise much. you you will. Okay, very good. Thank you. Chris, good to see you. Uh, Nancy, hi. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. 
<laughs> How you been? Been pretty good. A little arthritis in my leg. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> that happens when you live long enough. Yeah. Guess if, beats the alternative, I guess. If you're so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Introduce yourself, please. Welcome. Nancy York. Um, so my comments today is, is, are just excerpts from uh, my readings and uh, listenings to information. And really the bottom line, the top line, is uh, this is the rationale, part of the rationale for you to take into consideration as you uh, come to your regulations for oil and gas uh, in Lerma County. So on KUNC, I heard this great program, which you all could access. And what the, it's about uh, the folks that are plugging uh, orphaned wells. And in uh, what it says is that the uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Com Commission knows of 275 orphaned wells and 422 associated other locations and facilities. And that is, and there are likely more, because the state is taking uh, federal um, monitoring when we need to have monitoring inside our own county and state. Uh, some of the orphan wells are more than 100 years old. Others are just two or three decades. Um, lack of documentation is an uh, a situation. And um, they're, they're uh, at least 88 are considered high priority for plugging, meaning that the state sees them as a potential threat to nearby homes and, and buildings. Um, so the KUNC story goes on. It says that uh, Dave Anders, uh, the manager of uh, COGCC's orphan well unit, said the state has plugged mid to high priority wells, only 10 mid to high priority wells since July. And now that the, June, the, the unit's goal is to plug 38 per year. And um, it takes more than a week. The cost is upwards of $80,000 per well. And, and other information that came from, um, talks about how these the concrete and, and metal that they plug the wells with deteriorate, so it's likely that they will have to be replugged uh, later. So the cost goes up. And last year, the, the uh, state spent uh, $5 million to, out of the uh, general fund to close a few of the old uh, abandoned wells. Um, the, uh, one of the problems is within our state is, is that, whoops. Oh, Nancy, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. You ran out of time. You were, I was right on the edge of my seat listening. I didn't pay attention. Oh, well, that's good. Well, <laughs> uh, thank the, you. The, the summation is that it's underfunded. This, we don't make, uh, the state doesn't understand charge enough. And then there's the issue of the Ponzi scheme, where, and this is from Wall Street Journal, where the proceeds from oil and gas to the companies is less than, uh, they're just not making it. And uh, also the great number of bankruptcies that are happening between oil and gas. Bottom line. Yep, I understand. So Nancy had a, a small business where she would go around and hang flyers up. Yes. And for different events and things like that. And yes. she collects some amount of money to do so. And so a few years ago, when I was running for re-election, I saw Nancy. I ran into her and I said, uh, if I was going to have an event, like a barbecue, would you hang my flyers up? And you, do you remember what you said to me? I probably said, of course. You said, you said I would, but I would probably look for a little bit worse places to put them. <laughs> <laughs> In an abandoned well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, would be my I would suggestion. put them at the very bottom of all the uh, out of eye shot, but I would put them up for you, yes. Please don't take that as, <laughs> as associated with this. You're a, you're a hardworking entrepreneur. Thank you for all you do. Very uh, good. Good to see you again. Good to uh, see you. Uh, is there anyone else in attendance that would like to make? Oh, Marta, come on. 
I, I, I wasn't going to speak. Uh, oh, he knew you. Well, I know you better than that. Uh, well, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Marta Terman, Loveland's resident. Um, I'm just going to share some information with you just in the effort of trying to keep you guys updated on, on what's going on. So I'm really concerned about, obviously, oil and gas duh, um, but the southeastern part of our county. And I went to the um, Loveland City Council last week where they were discussing the approval of the Metro dis District being put in, or wanting, uh, that the uh, McWinney Corporation wants to put in 2,600 homes, okay, on the east side of 25. Yep. So while I was sitting in the meeting, I got curious. I'm like, oh, I wonder if there's any wells over there. So I sat and looked it up, and there are two producing wells currently owned by McQuinney Corporation right where they're going to put the homes. So the reason I bring this up, and their response was, oh, well, we're planning on closing them next year. Okay. Who knows? Yes, perhaps. Perhaps no. We don't know. But the point is, is in writing the land use regulations, and I will mention Matt and Leslie, because I know you guys are working on that, and thank you so much for your hard work on it. Where Matt, mm -hmm. go. Um, to consider with the setbacks, um, both uh, current use and forward use. So I hear this from forward use, and what I mean is um, if there's already a well, then limit the land use for development for, so, so that developers can't then plop homes within 500 feet of these wells. So that's it, just wanted to mention that um, and encourage you all to really consider, you know, forward thinking with these setbacks. Because if we've got appropriate uh, setbacks, then mm -hmm. I think that's gonna solve a heck of a lot of problems that we're seeing right now and a lot of conflict. So true, very good, thank, thank you. you very much. So um, does anyone else like to make public comment? Yeah, come on up, welcome. My name is Gayla, G-A-Y-L-A, Maxwell Martinez, and I'll be very brief. Mostly, I would just like you to know that I, too, am here because I'm concerned about the regulations for the oil and gas industry in Larimer County. Um, I literally have trouble sleeping at night after I've spent an afternoon reading about um, melting polar ice caps and thawing permafrost, um, dying coral reefs, and all these other things which there's not a whole lot I can do about it. I mean, I have an electric car, I have solar panels on my house. My power pretty much ends there. You have more. We the people have given it to you. You may not have the power to completely um, address global warming, but you do have the power to help keep under control the emissions in Larimer County that come from the oil and gas industry and that are contributing at least 50% to the terrible air quality that we have here in Fort Collins, day after day, of exceeding the ozone levels that should be here. So um, I'm just asking you to please take that into consideration. Um, we're depending on you to use the power that the people have given you to protect our public health and our environment. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Gayla. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? So all the people in the room, nobody wants to? You want to say anything? Okay, very good. Uh, so we'll close public comment. And uh, just for the sake, I know a lot of folks will take off um, at, as soon as public comment concludes. So I'm just going to tell you, um, last week uh, at the uh, meet, the regular meeting of the North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization, um, uh, we did have a nice presentation from the Regional Air Quality Council, which is really the organization that's charged with um, gaining compliance on uh, ozone emissions here in, in the, in the what well, we call it the non-attainment area, but here in the state of Colorado. It's the only um, uh, area of the Clean Air Act that we're actually currently out of compliance with is ozone. And he, he's, uh, he talked about the good work that's been done and the good work that will continue to be done. And, he, and his pledge to us as an, uh, the unified communities in northern Colorado was it within five years we'd be in compliance with the ozone with the with the actual lowered Obama administration ozone regulations? So that's really good. It's really good news. I know you're concerned, and I know there's always more we can do, but but I want you to understand that I, I think a lot of folks uh, from a lot of different stripes and on both sides of the aisle work very hard on this issue, and 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 we'll seek uh, continue to to seek to find uh, solutions to to this issue, and and we'll and ultimately with the goal of gaining compliance. So. Um, just a brief update I wanted to give. All right, let's move on.
Approval of the minutes. Are these the amended minutes? Do we have those, um, Elizabeth? Uh, Commissioner Cavalls had uh, mentioned a couple things he'd like to see changed. All right, so we have the we have those corrected minutes based on email communication from Commissioner Cavallis. I'd seek a motion to approve the minutes for the week of September 2nd, 2019. Commissioner Cavallis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion. All those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. Brenda Jimison is here to present the draft schedule for the week of September 16th, 2019. Hi. Good morning, Commissioners. How are you? Good. On Monday, September 16th at noon, you have the elected officials lunch at the Lost Cajun here in Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. At 1.30 p.m., you have the Community Development Work Session with Lori Cadridge, the Interim Director of Community Planning, Infrastructure, and Resources. At 3 p.m., you have the land use items with the Development Review Team. That's in the hearing room on the first floor. At 6 p.m., Commissioner Kafalas will attend the Wellington Board of Trustees Work Session at the Lieber Center in Wellington. On Tuesday, September 17th at 8.30 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will participate in the new employee orientation in the hearing room on the first floor. At 9 a.m., you have administrative matters at this meeting here in this room. At 12 p.m., Commissioner Cavallos will attend the Community Corrections Advisory Board meeting in the Carter Lake Conference Room on the first floor. At 2.30 p.m., you have an abatement hearing for Gerald and Susan Torgensen. On Wednesday, September 18th at 9 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will participate in a joint citizen meeting with Mayor Karspeck at, at the Trailhead Cafe in Berthoud. Oh. At 4 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Veterans Group meeting at the Boyd Lake Conference Room on the first floor. At 5.30 p.m., Commissioners will attend the third quarter joint regional elected meeting, and that's at the Ridgeline Hotel in Estes Park. Oh. On Thursday, September 19th at 6 p.m., Commissioners will host an open house at the Leaper Center in Wellington. And then on Friday, September 20th at 7.15 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the Executive Fair Board meeting at Lola Diner in Loveland. Wow. That would be all I have for the week. Very good. Any questions or comments for Brenda? No? Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. We're going to move on to consent agenda. Today, consent agenda has a uh, one agreement uh, for uh, asphalt and concrete construction projects throughout the county. <laughs> this is our on-call contracting uh, contract. Um, updates to our purchasing policy. Uh, three land use resolutions. Um, a miscellaneous item, a statement of authority, the Hazelhurst Conservation Easement and Assignment Closing, and four liquor licenses throughout unincorporated Larimer County. Would either of my colleagues like to remove any of these items from the consent agenda for additional information? I would not. No? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move approval of consent agenda for September 12th, 10th, 2019. Very good. The motion. All those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. Guess. Do either of my colleagues have a guest this morning? I do not. No? All right. Oh, wow. This is a big deal. The Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. Larimer County has received a uh, budget director. Who are, yeah, our Distinguished Budget Director will, will come forward and he will tell us about um, a major award that has been. Assistance. Yeah, and where's the, yeah, there's the sidekick. <laughs> uh, Larimer County has received the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award from the Government Finance Officers Association for the very first time. Very first time. Oh. Wow. So, uh, Josh, uh, you're our budget director. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about the Distinguished Budget Award? Sure. So, I am Josh Fudge, the county's budget director. With me is Matthew Bahanin, the uh, budget analyst. Uh, so, we make up the budget office staff. <laughs> um, as you're familiar, GFOA has a distinguished award for the um, CAFR, the uh, annual financial report. And so, this is very similar to that, um, only for the budget document. And so, it has a number of criteria that are best practices to basically uh, have the budget narrative be a, a policy document, a financial plan an operations guide and a communication method to the public to show uh, not only how much is the county going to collect, how much is the county going to spend, <coughs> but uh, what results are we going to achieve with those resources and, and things like that. Um, there's about 1,400 uh, units of government nationwide that, that win the award every year, so this is our first. We have about 36 years to go to catch up with finance, so um, <laughs> we're, we're going to do our best. Um, and just, uh, I'll just note that it's it's useful in one respect. We have rating agencies calls, rating agency calls with the, um, or for the certificates of participation this afternoon. And one of the questions they've asked is, you know, do you have a capital improvement plan? What's your capital budget and things like that? And so, 
by meeting the criteria for this award, we have that um, very specifically laid out in our narrative and we're able to say, yep, there it is, go take a look. So uh, we weren't always able to do that because our capital was integrated with operating and things like that. So uh, we're excited to win it and uh, look forward to winning it in the future. Very good. Anything you want to add? It's a very distinguished award. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> Manager Hoffman, go ahead. What is the award? Well, word? congratulations. Where is the award? Oh, there it is. Oh. Wow, it looks very distinguished. There's a photo op opportunity yes. right there. Congratulations to our budget team. And I think the most amazing thing about this is we are, you know, how the, there's that uh, saying about how it's hard to turn a big ship, and Larimer County government is a big ship. And I think the thing that's most amazing about making the incremental changes in order to be able to qualify and uh, achieve this award of excellence is that Josh and Matthew have worked incrementally to turn a pretty big ship in our budgeting process and in our budgeting documentation. And we appreciate the work you've done, the results you've achieved, and the transparency that this provides to our community. So thank you for your work. Very distinguished. Thank you. So yeah. other than the things you, me you mentioned about the capital, what kind of changes to the budget document do you think resulted in winning the award this year sure. as opposed to last year's document? So uh, one item is showing the number of position changes uh, from year to year. We didn't always do that. Um, not sure why. It just wasn't in the narrative. And so that's one of the key um, items. The other is to show our policies, especially related to the budget, uh, to some financial items, especially debt. Um, those were never in the narrative before, and so we've added those. It makes it uh, very transparent to those who are interested to see, you know, we have good, rigorous policies around financial management. Um, we budget conservatively on the revenue side. We have strong fund balances and those types of things. And so to see those policies uh, shows people like the rating agencies, for instance, that they do have this under control and, and they're thinking about these types of things. There's also trends. Uh, they like to see trends of revenues, expenses, you know, are our revenues staying stable or, or are they declining and, and things like that. So very good. Do you have any comments or questions? No, sir. Just congratulations. Yeah, it's a it's a really um, wonderful uh, certificate of reg uh, recognition there. It looks like it was printed on a Commodore 64, so you know it's good um, from back in the day. Um, we got a lot of stuff. You guys are always here, and frankly, Matthew, it's like the only day you didn't wear a tie since I've, since you worked here. Um, so we're going to grab a photo with you guys in, in a little bit, okay? We know you're around. We know where to find you. We're going to get a photo to put up on our Facebook page and everything so people know. I think it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, you know, it, it's the kind of thing that um, if you're a taxpayer in this county, you should, you should, should it should give you some, uh, some cause to, to think that, you know, adults are running the store here, and I think that's always important. Definitely. So, g thanks, guys. Good work. Another plaque for our cabinet elf. Yeah, our yeah. I can re finally replace the pie eating contest Please. photo. Not our brightest <laughs> moment. About that now. Good cause, but not that's our. The only award you got. Yeah, I, I won the pie eating contest once. That was the former me. All right. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You'd still win. Congratulations. Moving right along. Before we get this thing out of the ditch, um, the board's going to consider a letter. Um, to our current housing authorities regarding Larimer County's housing authority designation and consideration of uh, processes to provide services and resources. Heather O'Hare, uh, our Deputy Director of Human Services, is here, and um, we're going to hear about this. So, ladies, why don't you introduce yourself? So, Good morning. Heather O'Hare, Deputy Director for Human Services and the Goal Steward for Goal 2 of the Strategic Plan. Jennifer Fairman, Benefits Manager for Larimer County and Objective Team Lead for the affordable housing goal. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome. Heather, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you. So in our August 26 work session, we gave an extensive update on the objective team's activity. Um, a significant portion of that has been conducting a lot of research about what is the county's legal authority within the housing space um, and working with the clerk and recorder's office, as well as David Arud from the county attorneys, we determined or we learned that in 1981, the county actually distinguished itself as a housing authority. Um, but since that time, we haven't had a board that has um, overseen the activities of the housing of the Larimer County Housing Authority. Um, and so we made the recommendation to the board that we explore that a bit further, um, reinstitute the board, and then explore different uh, IGAs with service providers, resource providers that are already in existence across the county um, to 
provide services or resources mostly in the unincorporated areas of the county. So this letter is to inform the five existing housing authorities that that's um, the direction moving forward. So we wanted to present it here for your consideration. And then we've um, tailored it to each of the other four housing authorities. I think you just have the, okay. the Fort Collins okay. version in front of you. Questions, comments? Could you explain this a little bit to us, John? So, as, as you know, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, within goal number two, which deals with economic opportunity and community well-being, among other things, the uh, fourth objective is in regards to affordable housing. And right now it's stated as reducing the cost burden by 5%, and we're looking at changing that. And as Heather indicated, uh, a lot of research from her and Jennifer and others has gone into establishing or clarifying what our legal authority is. And based on our prior discussions, we've determined that it makes sense to retain that designation or restore that de designation uh, as a Larimer County Housing Authority so that we could address some of the gaps in the unincorporated areas regarding the, uh, the issue of the lack of affordable housing. And the idea here is that we would uh, partner with the various housing authorities like Housing Catalyst, uh, like the Loveland Housing Authority, et cetera, and we would identify you know, provisions in that proposed IGA uh, to address some of those gaps and continue to work collaboratively. I think this is a, a good way, a good move forward. I think good letter. And as far as the signature, I don't know what you think, Mr. Chair, whether the, as the board chair you should sign it or whether uh, perhaps I should sign it as the um, executive sponsor. Well, if it's an action of the board, it would probably be signed, be appropriate to either be signed by the chair or by all three commissioners. We, on occasion, will do that on things that we think are significant and important, and I'd be certainly welcome to, uh, or uh, willing to, uh, to accept that. So, um, any further discussion? John, would you like to make the motion for this? Uh, yes, uh, th thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move to approve the uh, draft of letter and of the uh, letter that we just presented uh, and determine who would sign, well, I move to approve the, the draft letter concerning the redesignation of the Lima County Housing Authority and, um, and determining that the three county commissioners uh, would sign this letter and it would be directed to the various housing authorities. Is great. that okay? I think it's great. Uh, we have a motion, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed three zero. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. All right, Lori, are you here? Okay, hi. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, a group call, calling themselves the Larimer Alliance, a number of their members were, are here uh, currently, um, sent a letter to the board and asked uh, the board to provide a response. Um, county staff has uh, drafted a written response uh, to the Larimer Alliance, and Lori Cadrich, the Director of Community Planning Infrastructure and Resources, is here to present that letter to the board uh, for deliberation and discussion if, if, if this will be the, uh, in fact, the letter that the board will send. So, welcome. Thank you, good morning. Um, the essence of the letter, I should clarify as well, covered a couple of other questions that came up after August 20th. And so the, the information that we have prepared in the letter would indicate that the board is not willing to suspend applications at this time because the board does not feel it's necessary to do so. And further directed staff to add the director's new criteria, the director of the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission's criteria, um, each time we would review any kind of permit. And that's um, in addition to the work that we previously did for review. The other area that the Alliance requested is would the board consider appointing uh, the vacancy on the current oil and gas task force and the board indicated that you would and I know that you're um, considering some applicants at this time. The more recent question dealt with um, our regulatory authority related to access permits. And that regulatory authority allows the engineering staff, when there is a change in use of a road, 
to consider granting an access permit or not. Um, the essence of that has to do with traffic safety, though, not the type of business that is being conducted. And so as I reviewed this with the county attorney's office, they did not feel that this would be an appropriate way to uh, place a moratorium on an any, any oil and gas activity because it is not a land use regulation. It's more similar to what, what you might consider a building permit, right? Does it meet certain criteria? And so that's the essence of our response. And I'm happy to, I'm happy, or our staff is here, happy to answer any questions you might have or further clarify the letter. Can we put that final point in the letter? Because the letter says we will provide that information as soon as possible. I, I know this is probably the first time the board's heard that conclusion. I I'm not surprised by it, but we now have the final. Right, Linda and I worked on this on Friday and it may not have got to you. So let me read the paragraph that we prepared um, we replace that sentence with this. We have been able to review your suggestion presented during our hearing on September 4th regarding, and then we list the section, right. to suspend issuing access permits for oil and gas development or considering a moratorium. Currently, Larimer County does not have an application process for oil and gas development. Therefore, we are unable to place a moratorium on a process that we do not have. Section 4.3.7 F1 applies to access permits, and those permits are for the purpose of ensuring traffic safety, not making land use decisions. As such, it would not be appropriate to prohibit the issuance of permits. Okay. I have a question. Uh, Commissioner Kvalls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurie. I appreciate your uh, work on this letter with the county manager and the updated information. I'm wondering, uh, understanding that the uh, the land use code, the section that you cited is is limited and has to do with traffic safety, but does that mean that if um, an oil and gas company is interested in submitting an application, uh, you know, we'll review that uh, based on the review criteria and then ultimately I guess it would go to the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, um, but do they also have to apply for an access permit? And then do we then do we determine if there are some uh, uh, traffic safety issues? Mm -hmm. could, could you speak to that, please? Yes, that's my understanding. So if, if for example, the permit that they're asking for, <clears throat> excuse me, if they didn't already have oil and gas activity on that road, then they would have to apply for an access permit. And then we would check the weight of the vehicles, the turning radius, those kinds of things. And then whatever that business would be would have to make adjustments to ensure that whatever that type of vehicle use would be is safe on that road or modifications were made to the road to ensure that it would be safe. And would that review also include uh, truck traffic volume? That's correct. And it would make a difference if it's a paved or unpaved road? Th that would be taken into consideration? That's my understanding. Thank you. Any additional questions? Mm -hmm. um, so. Comments? Commissioner, do you have any comments? No, I just uh, I appreciate, once again, the work of staff and uh, appreciate the engagement of the public and uh, that we are providing a formal response to the, it's actually the Larimer Alliance for Safety, Health, and the Environment. I mean, that's the, the full name, and just thought I'd state that for the record. Thank you. Very good. Linda, um, you'll get the board a uh, revised copy of the letter with this new draft language? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my colleagues have had a chance to read the letter? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'm going to support the letter as well for the men reasons that have been mentioned by um, – Ms. Cadrich and Commissioner Johnson, I look for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move approval of the signature of the Larimer Alliance letter as updated by Lori Cadrich's additional paragraph. Very good. We have a motion. Any further discussion? All those uh, in approval signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. Okay. Uh, that item is finished. County manager update. Manager. Well, it's still all about the budget, and so. Uh, Josh and Matt have been working hard on this year's budget. We've been working with um, all the offices who have submitted budget proposals. 
Uh, we also have been working on some of the some of the directives of the board regarding strategic plan and um, other things. I did remember that I was a bit tardy in submitting my summer quarterly report to you uh -huh. under poly policy governance, so I sent that to you, and it's available in your public email boxes. <coughs> I didn't know if you had any questions. Uh, it, there was a lot of green text on that, meaning that everything is operating according to policy, and I'm, of course, willing to answer any questions you might have for clarifications. Are there any questions with regards to the policy governance uh, submittal made by the manager? No? We were in compliance with we're everything. In compliance? That's good news. Well, when you win those budget awards and the yeah. finance awards, and that's a lot of what is in this quarter's report, and then, of course, the other thing that's in the report are updates on uh, just routine services, and you had a big performance review um, work session yesterday on both public records and internal services. Mm -hmm. Very and exciting. then we've also recently had a work session on the strategic plan, which is another big section of this quarter's report. So I don't think there were any surprises in the report, but I wanted to make sure that we didn't have a need for additional information that I had left unmet. Very good. Any other questions for the manager? No. No? Great. Commissioner activity reports. What were you up to, Commissioner Kafalos? Well, Beginning on Wednesday, September 4th, I attended the first session of the Water Literate Leaders class. Wow. There's about 25 participants. Uh, it was a very excellent session, a lot of good background on the history of water in Colorado and why it's important. This is a nine-month class, meets once a month. It's sponsored by the Community Foundation of Northern Colorado as well as the uh, Colorado Water Center at CSU. Wow, good stuff. So that was really good, and uh, I, I, I'm trusting that that will help me make informed decisions <laughs> as we move forward on a lot of important stuff dealing with water. Uh, then on Thursday, oh, <clears throat> I had my monthly community conversation in Wellington at the T-Bar Inn. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Tracy was present from our county engineering department, and he gave a more detailed update of the um, the issues related to the Box Elder Stormwater Authority and the East Side Detention Facility, uh, there were there was there were no there was no discussion regarding the other matter uh, as far as the uh, B dams and the, uh, uh, the, the the Box Elder uh, Basin Water Basin. Uh, good good meeting, good good exchange. Almost there, uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, then uh, that's okay. On Friday, I attended the uh, State Board of Human Services meeting in uh, Denver. And one of the things that we will be discussing at a later time, but the State Board of Human Services did uh, pass a resolution um, kind of aligning with the Department of Human Services regarding the proposed uh, rules to uh, SNAP, the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, proposed to change some of the rules regarding what's referred to as broad-based categorical eligibility. And so we did pass a resolution expressing our concern and um, I'm hoping that we can have a conversation to determine if the Larimer County Commissioners can take a position on that. If there's a public comment period, it ends September 23rd. On Saturday, I had another one of my community conversations. Yeah. Uh, this was um, at Dasbog on the patio. Nice. And it was great. It was, uh, the weather was uh, very nice. We had about 16 people or so, uh, and the train didn't come by at all. <laughs> so that makes it even better. But again, and actually Heather, Heather O'Hare was there, and she, uh, she uh, presented about our objectives three and four uh, on our strategic plan, uh, child care and um, affordable housing. And, and she's prepared with Jennifer and others a really excellent infographic. If you folks have not seen it, I'm happy to share that with you. That's all. Thank you. That's it? Thanks for listening. No, it was great. I was on the edge of my seat. I um, just like earlier. So, does the, John, the copy of the letter from CDH, P, CDHS says you just suggest we discuss this at admin matters. Is that today or I think yes. we can do it later next week? Today. Admin matters. Oh, did I say admin matters? I don't know. That's what this admin note direction. Says. I think. Oh.
I think we, we were going to discuss, can, uh, my can, mistake, can, admin directions. Can somebody from our human services department be there to talk about what categorical eligibility there is? There is someone from our human services department here today. Yeah, well, or some, send a representative or you something. Not make any, we don't make you any not take any action, no, but you I could talk about the background. About background yeah, it would come next week to admin and, matters. And okay, if we decide very to good. Take yeah. I think I know what categorical eligibility is, but I want to make sure I understand it in the context of this and what what the implications are with and without it. And mm -hmm. uh, certainly, and, and also Laura has, Laura Walker, our director, has some local data about the possible implications, how it would impact Larimer County folks who might get bumped off of uh, food assistance. I don't mind talking about it now if you, yeah. if you want to. Or it's on the want. agenda, though, okay. so let's, let's, okay. let's not. Okay. Okay, what's your report? My report? Yes. So Tuesday, I went to the Parks Advisory Board meeting, and uh, the, I think the top item was a presentation of a visitor survey which I think the board is going to get that presentation in the future, are we? Yes. It was very interesting that the, the mm -hmm. folks have surveyed, I think, over a 1,000 visitors to, uh, like they selected a few um, top spots, Horse Tooth Reservoir, Horse Tooth Mountain Open Space, was it Devil's Backbone as well? And uh, talked to folks about their experience, uh, what they attend the parks to, what activities they engage <coughs> in, uh, their satisfaction level with the parks. It was a very in-depth. I think CSU helped with that study as well. So it is a very good snapshot of um, what's happening at our parks. So I, I, I guess we'll be getting that in the near future. Mm. Thursday, the county manager and I, along with Mayor Wade Troxel from yeah. Fort Collins and fun. Estes Park Town Administrator. I don't know what you were doing, but it sounds fun. It was. Travis. Okay. Travis Mahalik. Mahalik spoke to the CSU capstone class, which visited, they were here in the courthouse. And this is through the Strayer Policy Center, I believe it is. Um, the students take this class. They We have gone to their graduation in the past. Each student selects a local government project um, that they present to us. Um, they're very interested in local government. So we spent an hour and a half with them talking about uh, what the county does, and then Travis and the mayor talked about what cities do, what some of the opportunities are for careers in local government, uh, how we, um, the, the broad variety of issues we consider, how policymakers relate to uh, management. The students had a lot of questions for the manager, the two managers present about how they do their jobs and their responsibilities, and how they relate to the policymakers and how they relate to the community. It's always interesting and fun and rewarding to talk to students. They, they have very good questions and they're very interested in local government. And the manager did a wonderful job. Oh, I'm sure. The commissioner did a wonderful job. Oh, God. The other two were okay, too. In our electorate of two, they both got 100% of the votes. Congratulations. All right. Congratulatory. I know, I know. It's a self-licking ice cream cone. We've built, we've built it. We finally mastered it. Great, great. A uh, few things I'd like to mention to uh, for the benefit of the board. Uh, I had the opportunity to represent the Board of Commissioners at the 2019 Loveland Business Appreciation Breakfast event um, held in Loveland. I know uh, Assistant Manager uh, Volker was there with me, as well as uh, some folks from our county fairgrounds uh, ranch facility, which is actually in Loveland. Uh, it was a nice event and uh, a nice thing that the City of Loveland does to thank uh, those folks who... Um, to uh, help our economy in, in, in Loveland. Um, I-25 Coalition met last week. I attended on behalf of the board. Um, we, we had a pretty lengthy discussion about uh, with regards to uh, a proposal by CDOT to kind of uh, to do away with the I-25 frontage road, at least from probably at least Highway 34 um, south through uh, Weld County, we call that county, uh, and, and, and actually replacing it with uh, designating uh, County Road 3, which is Larimer County Road 3, uh, and, and Weld County Road 9 and a half as uh, sort, of a, a sort of a de facto frontage road. It's very good for the department for a couple reasons. Number one is it gives them that extra right of way where the frontage road sits, so they don't have to acquire as much right of way if they want to expand the interstate, which they do right now. Um, secondly, 
Uh, the frontage road is kind of dangerous. If you've ever taken the frontage road, you come right up on the ramps, and you know you're right up, you're right next to the ramps, and there's a lot of traffic. And so, there, from a safety perspective, frontage roads, the frontage roads represent some kind of challenges as well. And so, uh, we we're working uh, with uh, on a conceptual plan. Um, there are some there's some uh, challenging aspects to that. Lori probably knows uh, with regards to what's being proposed particularly on the very tiny segment that's actually in Larimer County. Uh, I made uh, those concerns known, trust me, uh, to uh, representatives from CDOT, and we will continue working through it because it's actually a solid plan. It's a great plan. It's just the how. It's not the why or the what. It's the how. How you do it is important. We always say that. Um, manager and I uh, spoke to the Loveland Chamber of Commerce uh, Legislative Affairs Committee yesterday. Um, we talked about uh, county's proposed uh, infrastructure and facilities sales tax. Um, I think we were well received by the group. Uh, I don't know if they will support our efforts or not, but I think they asked good questions and they received a great presentation, right? Manager, you did a great job. Well, all I do is provide information. Notice that she didn't say I did a great job like she did when you said. And you did a great so, job. There you go. There you go. Answering all the difficult you only questions. Need, you only need two votes, Linda, to keep your job, <laughs> so you better kiss up when you can. Um, I need more. The other thing I was going to mention is the uh, Upper Front Range Transportation Planning Region met. We meet, court, we meet four times per year, and this is the meeting that we met in Fort Morgan. So it was quite a drive out, and um, but a good meeting. Um, we get uh, a small amount of the upper front range region, region is in the ozone non-attainment area, which we've spent a lot of time talking about today. But only a small portion of Larimer and Weld counties is in that region. Morgan County, is, which is also part of the upper front range, is not. And so we get a little bit of uh, CMAC funding, it's federal money, to uh, address uh, air quality issues. And so um, this year, about uh, $800,000 is going to go to Estes Park for a project there. It's a roundabout on... I don't know. Is it on 36 and thir and 34? I don't know where it is. It's a roundabout project. You, nobody knows. Nobody else anybody in here that knows. Anyway, the funding is actually going to Nessus Park this year. It's a it's kind of a big boon for them. Um, I think it's a about a two and a half million dollar roundabout project, and about eight hundred thousand dollars of federal funding is coming. So it's a it's a great example of uh, local governments. There. There's a number of local governments that are members of this uh, entity, this upper front range entity. All of us working together to really prioritize one important project and move it forward and see that it gets done. And so that was what happened uh, at that meeting. Um, the MPO Council, the North Front Range Metropolitan Planning Organization Council, met in severance that evening, Thursday evening. It was Transportation Day. And um, we had a great presentation from uh, the RAC, the Regional Air Quality Council, which I spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, the presentation showed that in the last uh, decade, um, ozone, which is the uh, one piece of the Clean Air Act that we are actually not in compliance with, our ozone values have dropped approximately 20 percent here in the North Front Range area. Um, and during that same amount of time, I'm not really sure what the exact population increase has been, but I assume it's been about 20 percent in Larimer and Weld counties. The number of oil wells in, in Weld County has almost doubled during that same amount of time. And uh, so to see a 20 percent, nearly a 20 percent reduction in our ozone levels is great news. Uh, we're still out of compliance. I won't lie to you and say we aren't. We are out of compliance. Um, but because of the really um, positive movement that we've had, uh, the dir executive director of the RAC, who is with us at that, that meeting, says he believes that we will gain compliance in the next five years. I think that's really important. It's important and it's great news because everyone wants to breathe clean air. And it, current strategies or with any new strategies did he mention that? well it's current it's current strategies um, but that doesn't I don't think it precludes the right. perhaps some additional some additional strategies so a lot of those things are um, emissions controls on vehicles right they continue to get better vehicles um, emit less every every year they you know they have a, a mandate to decrease emissions by a certain amount across the, the vehicle fleet of every manufacturer um, we, one of the big things that we did, and I voted for this, and I helped enact this, was you know in, enhanced tank controls for oil and gas industry. Prior to that, they had they had absolutely no tank controls, so they vented a lot out of their tanks of uh, you know um, ozone precursors and things like that. And so part of the regulations that we adopted uh, four years ago were to actually to enhance those tank controls. So as that as that technology improves. Um, we'll we'll see um, we'll see uh, enhancements. One thing that they've done is since they don't vent tanks anymore, 
they pump all that stuff back into the pipes. And so they actually have diesel motors to, to, to pump that. So you've, 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 you've made it better by not venting, but you've probably made it a little, on the, on the fringe, you've made it a little worse by having diesel motors that are, that are um, creating emissions. And so um, that's an area where you could, you could see some improvement is trying to um, improve the emission standards of some of those motors and things like that. So, so yeah, I think the strategies are solid. Um, there will be work around the edges to try to, to try to move it. Um, and you know, a lot of it is outside of our control. It's, um, it's, uh, there's a lot of biogenic sources of, um, of, uh, uh, of ozone precursors from, from fir trees. Uh, there's, uh, there's a hot, hot, dry temperatures impact our ozone levels, uh, very significantly in ways that we can't control. Um, there's also outside events. Sometimes we'll have forest fires or, or environmental types of events that happen out, well outside of Larimer County, obviously, and outside of the north front, the front range even of Colorado that impact our quality as well. So um, we will continue to work on the things that we have control over, and we're um, hopeful that we're going we're gonna to gain compliance. So good news on that front. The right. tank venting is huge because those tanks are very large, and when they're almost emptied, there's yeah. a little bit of hydrocarbons in there, and hydrocarbons are very volatile, so they can de and they have very high vapor pressure. They can develop a lot of VOCs inside that tank, and then when you fill it, you're forcing the air that's in there and all the out. compounds mm -hmm. out. So that that's huge. It is a big deal. It's a big deal. I don't pretend to understand how the hell they do it, but um, it's good news I anyway. Just explained to you how. Okay. It well. <laughs> He is a doctor, after all, I guess. Okay. All right. The board is going to enter executive session. So before we do okay. that, oh, Commissioner, go ahead. Yesterday, at, I'll introduce it. Yesterday at the 1.30 meeting. Hang on one second. Oh, are you talking about this? What are you talking about? What am I talking about? We're, we're going, we're to, uh, John had a question about, I think, about emissions. We're going to go into executive session to talk about the SLR. Well, that's agreement. not what I was talking about. Okay. Do you, want, do you have a question related I, to what I, I think, said? Well, yesterday at the um, community development work session, you missed it. That's why we are bringing it up now. They're we, sharing one mind. We couldn't do they it just yesterday. Transfer it from guy to guy. We, dis we discussed having oh. a preliminary conversation about um, uh, the, the recommendations provided to us by staff on the uh, oil and gas appointment, and I thought we were going to have that conversation uh, and then uh, suggest a, a top three, and that this way the uh, staff could contact them to see if they're available. Okay. Well, why the hell didn't you guys bring that up? Well, I forgot. No. I thought John was going to bring it up. Okay. We weren't of one mind on that one. But I guess not. Um, yesterday, uh, Lori uh, and Matt, Sit um, tight. in order to fill the vacancy we have on the task force, they went through and selected five individuals, I believe, on this spreadsheet who had similar experiences to the individual that left. And um, they asked if we would look at those and give them our suggestions so that they can contact that person to make the appointment. Of course, we'd have to do that next Tuesday, but they wanted us to kind of give them some in direction or indication of what we thought of those five people. Um, I've looked through them, and I have a first and a second choice um, for it, but I don't know what the rest of you guys think. I know what John thinks, because he mentioned that Monday. John, what do you think? Oh, well, I also reviewed the, uh, the five names and their qualifications, and I also well, I have uh, you know, my top three or four choices, but I can go with the you know the top two. Shall I offer those? Sure. I was going to do that. Yeah. Okay. So my, what do you think? My first sure. choice would be uh, Dr. Adrian Kraus. As I've mentioned, I, I offered this name to the uh, staff, and I think I've discussed it. She uh, is a, a medical doctor and obstetrician who works at the women's clinic. She has been attending uh, the task force meetings, and so I think she's... Uh, up to speed on, on some of the progress, and also I, I think she's well versed in terms of the research as it relates to uh, the oil and gas industry and uh, the potential uh, impacts, medical impacts. So that is my first choice, uh, and I'm also responding to what the community has expressed, and that is that we ought to try to get uh, public health or a medical professional on the back on the uh, task force. Uh, the, my second choice was um, another physician, Michael Tobin, family physician in Fort Collins, and um, that's the, on the first page there. Uh, Michael Tobin is your second choice? Yes. Is that it, John? He has two choices. Okay. My first choice was Michael Tobin, a family physician in Fort Collins. 
And the reason I uh, selected Michael as my top preference was he says he's open-minded and strives to see and hear things from others' perspectives, and I've been looking for people on the task force that um, don't come with a particular predetermined agenda that bring experience and will look at all of the issues, uh, give us the benefit of their experience, uh, and make a decision based on that. I think my second choice would probably be Molly McLaughlin. Uh, she has a very extensive PhD this fall experience on chemical and toxicological impacts associated with oil gas. She's prepared a lot of uh, uh, testimony, um, expert testimony on that issue. And I, I, I would give um, Adrian my third choice, um, partly because she has attended the meetings and I think that would give her the ability to probably step in right away uh, and participate, but th those are my top three choices. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that. Yeah, I have. I looked at it yesterday. Um, my number one choice is going to be uh, Molly McLaughlin, soon to be Dr. McLaughlin, uh, PhD uh, student at Colorado State University in environmental engineering. Um, she's worked. Uh, we so the person who stepped off the um, the the committee, uh, Dr. Um, What's her name? Herkobian? Is that her? Was that her Herkobian, name? Herkobian, yes. It, she was a, uh, I don't want to misstate it, uh, but I, my, I believe she was a, cl a climate scientist, right? And so Miss um, McLaughlin's uh, resume, where she worked as a researcher um, at Georgia Tech, Emory University, EPA Region 8, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and has worked on uh, um, oil and gas ex extraction and um, and on air quality impacts uh, with regards to, to that uh, uh, industry. So she was my top choice. And my second choice was Gregory Clark, who is a, a member of the Fort Collins Air Quality Board and also uh, works with a company that actually um, collects and manages emissions uh, data uh, for the oil and gas industry in primarily in Wyoming, I believe. Um, so I thought uh, he would really know about, uh, have some expertise in um, how air emissions operate, uh, that kind of the, um, and, and what the most effective strategies to mitigate that would be. So those were my two top choices. Um, so each of us had, so John's top choice was Steve's third choice. Steve's top choice was John's second choice. My top choice was Steve's second choice. Is that clear direction, Lori? Yeah, there you go. Go make an appointment there. This is how we do this. Everybody wanted to see how interesting this is. And so I, I wasn't aware that we were giving a top three, but I, I, I would say if I was Did to you give, give three, I only give two. Well, you gave three. Two. I got extra credit. Mm. I'm He's over, an overachiever. I'm an overachiever. I, I certainly am open to. Uh, so your third choice. Well, I'm certainly open to Molly McLaughlin. Um, and that's where there's some agreement, so that might be one person to contact. I, I'd still like to advocate for Dr. Adrian Krause as an obstetrician because um, I, I think she, like anyone, everyone has to set aside their biases and look at the science and the research, and the fact that she's an obstetrician, I think, could help inform the discussions about uh, how the, you know, what are the impacts on, on newborn babies, people who are pregnant, women who are pregnant, et cetera. That's why I think she would be good. So, Lori, it sounds like does that seem like do we have consensus then that we could contact uh, Ms. McLaughlin, McLaughlin and ask her if she's willing to serve? She may not be. She's getting her. She's currently a PhD so, candidate. She so may not have time. Who right? would be the so. backups? Yeah. Okay. Um, who was the second most favored? Well, Tobin was your first choice, Steve, and John's second choice. Uh, Krauss was John's first choice and your third choice. My second choice was the guy on the Fort Collins Air Board, and then uh, he was not selected by either of you. So should we give those three names to Lori in that order? Which, what was the second would be Tobin? Is that okay, John? I'd like Krauss to be second. I don't know if I know Tobin. Do you have? Do you want to, Kraus to be second? I, that's fine with me. I don't. I don't have any strong. Okay, Kraus second, feet. Tobin third. Thank you. There you go. Got it. Yes. Great. Good work being done here.
right there. Your tax dollars at work efficiently. You're using that st your time efficiently. It took us two days. Okay. All right. Okay. Here we go. I'm sure there'll be lots of criticism of that process. I'm sure. The board is going to enter executive session to discuss modifications to the Estes Park Intergovernmental Agreement regarding administration of the land use code within the Estes Valley. This is a um, discussion item only with our county attorney. There's no decision expected to be made as a result of this hearing. So when we recess from open session, we will not be reconvening in open session. We will uh, recess directly from executive session. All right. So. We will need a motion in our executive session. I believe it's your turn, Commissioner yeah, Kafalis. You got it? Okay. Let's have it. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I move the Lamar County Board of Commissioners enter into executive session to discuss modifications to Estes Park Intergovernmental Agreement regarding administration of the land use code within the Estes Valley pursuant to Colorado Revised Statutes 24-6-4024B. And that states uh, conferences with, with an attorney for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Very good. We have a motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3-0. Thanks, everybody, for coming.